Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I have touch, please? All quiet, please. Thank you. Um, go ahead, have your notes out. We're going to be continuing on. We'll wrap up with the Russian uh, Civil War. Uh, I've got a little so-called three-minute video that actually is like four and a half minutes. Oh, well. Um, which, if when you look at it, you're like, okay, this is, makes some sense. If I'd watched this before we did any of the, the notes on all the different red and black and green and, and white and... Czechoslovakian, like what are they doing in this? It would have made no sense whatsoever. Hopefully it'll make some sense. And then today we'll be getting into, we'll start the Irish War of Independence. So if you look in your notes, that's on page two, Irish War of Independence. And for your sake, we're gonna do a lot of background. Anybody gonna have Irish heritage in here that you're aware of? Yes, indeed. Um, and if you check, so like when did your first uh, relatives come over, if they came over from Ireland, do you know? Well, I think a lot of people, I don't know specifically from Ireland when they came in, but I had, I had an ancestor um, that was actually on the Mayflower. Um, and so I think wow, so that's like way before. I, I think yeah. a lot of people probably have that same guy. That same guy? Yeah. Well, he must have well, been, anyway, yes, quite well, prolific. So yeah. Um, to understand what the heck went on in the Irish War of Independence where, the, where many of the Irish, not all, said, we're finished with you, Britain, and became independent. So if you look over there, uh, not at the very top, but just below that, Ireland, green and white and orange, that's the flag for Ireland. And then right next to that is the Union Jack, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So there's going to be some splaining to do with respect to this whole thing. And since we got started on it yesterday with the uh, first and third periods of uh, yesterday, uh, we got into like a lot of the background. So we'll be getting that to you guys today. As far as overview, big picture and so forth, this is the last week of the semester. Okay. As I mentioned to you, some of you guys uh, were here um, uh, earlier and I've got the IAs in power school, okay? I've got the IAs in power school. Um, check on those, check to see if there's any messages and so forth. Um, with, re with respect to the semester grade, I think I communicated with one student with respect to some things that need to be done to remedy. Um, other things are gonna be done next semester. I've, there's quite a few, and I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity to say, like if like there's a section missing, like a reflection section, some of the papers people didn't get around to the reflection section, I'm like, I don't really want to have a meeting with a student on that section to give them feedback on it, unless I actually see that section. So there'll be some, and we'll do this early um, next semester, like next week, um, where I'll be kind of giving communication to students to like do certain things and get those to me fairly quickly so that I can set up a meeting. Because that's what's going to be taking place early on next semester. Lots of meetings with students on their IA so I can give very helpful and specific advice on what to do to improve. Does that make sense? Because when is your final IA due? It's going to be due like in May. Yeah, I think I've got the date for you guys as May the 14th. So there should be plenty of time to uh, get everything all polished up. That will be a 100-point assignment as well for next semester, as well as doing all the other units and things that we're doing on that, okay? And if you have questions and concerns and so forth, you know, shoot those to me. I mean, that's what, you know, that's what I'm here for. But officially, I get one meeting, and so I want to make sure, I want to say maybe 20, 25% uh, of the juniors will have like some work to do on it before I'll even set up the meeting date with, with folks. I mean, if it's just a bunch of misspellings and things like that, I mean, I can point that out. But if there's like a whole section missing, I'm like, I want to make sure you know what you're doing and I'll point back to um, like the template and the sample and so forth of what to do on that, okay? With respect to your grade, check on that to see where you're at. Um, I think by like 3 o'clock today, um, and if you really needed time because you're like hunkered down, um, I just got a notice yesterday that although the semester ends on Friday, our final grades aren't in until like sometime later next week. So if you are planning on doing some extra points, I think I've got a couple of essays 
that can be done for extra points based on the last test that you guys did. Um, and there's, there's some like quiz extra points that can, can be done. And then also, when you guys come in here on Friday, we'll do the um, end of semester feedback form, which I always try to do uh, for five points at the end of each semester. So that's like a five point thing. So my point is to you, if you're like close to the next highest grade for the semester, just make sure you're on top of that so that you can do that. Okay, and if there's anything else that needs to be done, uh, please make sure to do that. Any questions? Okay. Um, today is Inauguration Day. Um, I already checked the news. Some of you guys check the news regularly. Uh, President Trump um, gave his farewell speech at Joint uh, Base Andrews. It used to be called Andrews Air Force Base. I guess, I guess other people use it now, too. Anyway, and he's heading to Florida. Where I think, Evan, he's going to take a nice rest with his family. He's probably already got other people to like pack or unpack and so forth. Um, yeah, and within two hours, uh, they will be assembled a, fair, a fairly small-ish, comparatively small-ish group of people for the inauguration of Vice President Harris and President Biden. And that will take place around about 10 o'clock. I know some of you guys are checking. Um, I'm not going to be doing it live and so forth, but it's definitely going to be recorded. Hopefully, really, the only news that's going to come out of that is the content of Biden's speech. Hopefully, everything else will be just very calm during the day. I know uh, the vice, uh, the, those in the group, Pence will be there, and former presidents, I think Obama and George W. Bush, Bill Clinton. Uh, Jimmy Carter's not feeling well, so I don't think he'll be there. But they'll be looking out instead of like vast crowds and so forth. Apparently, they've got flags. Have you guys seen that? Like flags for all, like a whole bunch of flags for each of the different states and for the six different territories. So they'll be out there. So it'll be very different. It was already going to be different because of COVID. And then, you know, what happened on the 6th obviously, you know, impacted uh, plans and so forth. So anyway, hopefully today will be, um, I'm sorry, pretty boring as far as like <laughs> newsworthy events. I mean, inauguration is already a very important newsworthy event. For those of you guys who are wondering about this, I've already got things in plan, and I was printing out like the new ones, but I realized that my <coughs> color ink it ran out on my computer, or on my printer at home, so I had to order. <laughs> so it's going to arrive tomorrow, so we'll get that there. Um, I'm going to add one. Basically, it's going to be, you guys will be okay. Those of you guys who are like, symmetry, symmetry, there will be one added to each row. Right? So obviously we're going to put Biden next to Trump, but I'm going to reconfigure it and so forth and give homage to the real first presidents of the United States under the Articles of Confederation. So we're putting John Hansen up there, folks. Yeah. Yeah, he'll get a full spread. And then the one right next to it will be like the other six or seven guys who are <laughs> presidents. No power whatsoever. I mean, hello. But it's a good reminder that our country's been around longer than our presidents have been around. At least the presidents that we think of as actually having power. Yeah. So, yeah. I had when this was first put together because my wife really helped me out and did the design and so far. I'm like, make it big so the numbers and the faces and the, and, and the names so people can read it. And sometimes people squint and they're like, that's the date. You know, that's really an eye check. If your eyesight isn't that very good. Um, I had a blank there, because when I first put it up there, there was like a question mark, uh, because the, uh, the race was on between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, and then uh, Trump won. So if you look over there really carefully, you can see it's overlaid. I think I taped it to uh, the one that was there. I'll be taking that one down to put a new one. It's got the same image, but it has the dates with brackets, you know, 2017 to 2021. And then you've got Biden, 2021 to, I don't know. But I tell you what, I think it'll be okay because I don't think I'm going to have to make any more changes on the board. I was a little nervous that like Trump might just go, oh, what the heck, and resign with one day. And then the 46th president would be Pence for one day, you know, whatever. But that has not happened, so that numerical <coughs> thing. So the shortest lived president, the shortest tenured president, is number nine still. William Henry Harrison, <coughs> who only lasted about a month after his inauguration day because he got thick, like with pneumonia, and he went, do. 
Yeah, so Tippecanoe, the winner of the Battle of Tippecanoe, was quickly followed by Tyler, too. Okay, John Tyler served out the remainder of that presidency. So, any questions, comments? Okay, let's go ahead and do the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> All stand, please. Okay, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Okay, got a little bit of announcements for you. This came in yesterday. Look forward to more information. Valentine's crushed sodas and scavenger hunt. I think there's already, they were putting some signs up yesterday, student council. So yeah, Valentine's. It's almost February and then there's March. And then it's June. No, actually, there's a few things in between there. Second semester begins on Monday. Um, you guys do know that, uh, actually, you have a normal day on Wednesday, so never mind. Yeah, but check because, like, for my planning, it's a little squirrely. I'll be having, like, some video that we're going to be doing in here. Just because I'm not going to see the blue day on Tuesday because they're canceling everything because of PSATs. And are any of you guys doing the PSATs? We don't have a Friday half day this week, next week, do we? No. No. Don't. Oh, no. No. This, this week. It's this week. Okay, but I told you, right? You guys know that you, you, on Friday you guys are out of here at 11 o'clock. Okay, well, I said it, so now you've heard it. Any other news? Basketball? How's basketball going? By who? Liberty? I don't know. Oh, they, they must have done something. I wonder. Oh, theirs is? Liberty is? Oh. How about the guys? Darn! And they do schedule four quarters. Darn it. All right. So I'm sure you've got a good, like, uh, notes and stuff from your, uh, from your coach. All right. Go Huskies. No more games this week, or? On Friday? All right. Go Huskies. All right. Any other announcements? Okay. <laughs> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to go ahead and play this for you. This is the uh, three-minute history recap, which takes four minutes, and most of it we covered. If you start looking and going, oh, my gosh, the Russian Civil War is going to be crazy. Yeah. When you take the test, am I going to put, like, crazy Russian names and so forth on there? Mm-hmm. And colors? Which was the color, which color clearly had the most victory? Thank you. Which, I don't know if you give it a color, but they supported, uh, which area did the Reds not win? The Baltic States, good. So Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Poland. And think of Nemo. He's got a little... Finland. There we go. I knew that clue would work for somebody. That's my lucky Finn, or whatever they say. Anyway, so yeah, that was the only ones. Everybody else lost to the Reds. In 1917, during World War I, Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks took power in the October Revolution in Russia. This threw the country into a period of chaos, and nations across the old empire began separating and fighting the Bolsheviks, notably Finland, Ukraine, Poland, the Cossacks, the Caucasian states, and the Baltic states. However, wow. when the Bolsheviks made peace with Germany in March 1918, many of these nations were left under German influence. Plus, many would go on to fight civil wars and wars against other new states. Meanwhile, in Russia, people rose up against the Bolsheviks, opposing left-wing groups as some of the first to fight, while monarchists, republicans, farm volunteers, and various other anti-Bolsheviks made alliances with the regionalists and formed the White Movement. In early 1918, the Whites under Alexander Korchak established their government in the East. But the first major battles took place in the Northern Caucasus, where the Whites had a great deal of support from the Cossacks. Otherwise, peasants defending their villages formed Green Armies, and anarchists formed Black Armies. But in May 1918, the Bolsheviks prevented the Czechoslovak Legion from traveling to fight their Austrian enemies. So they were told to so, Can you get the something to me before the week's out or so? Okay, if you can do that, that would be great. Okay. 
that will be held. Okay. All right. Thank you. And the white armies of Flanders. By late 1980, the Bolsheviks only really held power in the western industrial cities, although they did have supporters all over. But then in November 1980, World War I came to an end. Eastern Europe was redrawn and thrown into chaos once again, and the Allied powers, except Japan, slowly began to withdraw their troops. So seeing that opportunity, the Bolsheviks launched an offensive as far west as Poland, hoping to export their revolution to Europe. This was possible because Leon Trotsky had just implemented forced conscription, increasing the size of the Red Army to around a million men. And wow. unlike the whites, they had a united command. Nevertheless, by March 1919, this offensive ended in failure, and they only really took control of Belarus. In the east, the Red Army had more success. In April, they successfully counterattacked Kolchak's advance, and for the remainder of the year, pushed his armies further and further east. But in the south, White Army General Denikin launched a major offensive hoping to take Moscow, while General Yudinich, working with the Estonians, began to push on Petrograd from the north. Denikin advanced quickly and threatened Moscow, so the Bolsheviks formed an alliance with the Black Army in Ukraine. That oh, that alliance! The Black Army were able to cut off Denikin's overstretched supply lines, forcing him to retreat. This allowed the Soviets to repel the assault on Petrograd and reoccupy lost land in the south. At the beginning of 1920, the Bolsheviks finally had to admit they could not break the Baltic states, so began to withdraw and would later recognize their independence. Meanwhile, in the east, the White Army was all but destroyed. The Whites handed Kolchak over to the Bolsheviks to be executed. However, to appease Japan, Lenin created the Far Eastern Republic to act as a buffer state. In the south, Peter Rangel replaced Denikin as head of the White Army. However, by now, the Whites could no longer effectively fight both the Black and Red Army. In April 1920, with the Whites on the retreat and an army a couple million strong, the Bolsheviks were able to invade Azerbaijan and secure its oil reserves. However, the Polish and the Ukrainians made an alliance and launched an offensive Still following the this? hoping to reunite the Ukrainian state. They captured Kiev in early May, but they were still met by a numerically superior Red Army. The Red Army's counterattack drove deep into Poland, but it was eventually halted at the Battle of Warsaw in August 1920. The Polish made a separate peace with the Bolsheviks. This guaranteed Polish independence, but placed Ukraine and Belarus firmly under Bolshevik control. Then, in late 1920, the remnants of the White Army began to flee en masse. This allowed Lenin to break his treaty with the Black Army and turn on them. The Order Black 66. Army finally surrendered in August 1921, and their leader, Nestor fled to Romania. In the meantime, in the winter of 1920 and 21, the Bolsheviks invaded Georgia and Romania and pushed the White Army support into a break in Mongolia. Although pockets of resistance remained, notably in Central Asia and the Persians, the Japanese withdrawal from Siberia and the Bolshevik annexation of the Far Republic in 1922 effectively ended the civil war and the Soviet Union was created. Millions died during the war and both sides carried out a staggering number of massacres and executions. To give just a small example, the White Army carried out pogroms in Ukraine while the Red Army killed and deported hundreds of thousands of Cossacks. Ooh. Did that help? A little bit? Yeah, and then you're like, oh my gosh, there was more stuff in there, and also it was going kind of fast and kind of crazy. Russian Civil War, bloody, 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 and very impactful on the history of the world, because the communists are going to be in charge of, this, of what has become the Soviet Union and Russia, okay? Questions or comments about that? All right, now, new component in your notes. The Irish War of Independence, which is, what is that? Uh, so you want to have that with you, have that in front of you so you can look at that because I'm going to be saying some stuff. You're going to go, what did he just say? Did he say shin? There's no H. There's no S-H in S-I-N-N. -N. Anyway, so have those in front of you because those will be very helpful. Um, on the bottom, the bottom half of page two. We'll be talking about the Irish War of Independence from 1919 to 1921. So we're following the chronology. So this is like right after World War I. Any extra no packets to go along with the packets that I already handed out? Oh my gosh. Should I give you one of the extra ones I did for the mission, which is about like killing Native Americans so that we can take down their... Uh, Oh my gosh, I've got one you can borrow, okay, yeah. I do usually make some extra ones so that people can have that, so you can borrow that, so you can have that. Otherwise, it is also on Google Classroom, okay, so if you, uh, if you are looking to get another copy,
Google Classroom. All right, so the Irish War of Independence is going to be right after World War I. <laughs> what a time to fight a war when everyone's tired of fighting war. Yeah. Actually, that's a good time to fight a war if you're going to bring up a war against somebody who is tired of fighting a war. How many of you guys have ever taken advantage of your parents being really, really tired and you're like, you just move in? That's actually kind of dangerous. Did it work? Or did it like blow up in your face because they're just like, the fuse is short and they're like, man, not interested in engaging at this time and they shut you down. All right. Well, you can write this down. Go ahead. The Irish War of Independence will be successful. Ireland will gain independence from Britain, which is very tired. Yeah, the United States of America, <coughs> United States of America gained independence from Britain after a fight. <coughs> Well, uh, actually, actually, I would say this. The United States of America <clears throat> actually really did, a lot of them really did like the British, okay? I mean, like John Adams, you know, good grief, you know, Mr. Independence and so forth. He was like, okay, let's have more solid, positive relations with Britain. And they're quickly going to, like, you know, be on good sides. I mean, a good example is, who helped Britain in World War I? We did. Who helped Britain in World War II? Here's an example of how in Ireland, they didn't. You can write this down. In Ireland, there were people that were like, man, we have been putting up with the English, in particular, for a long time. We hate them. So speaking of World War II, when we get to World War II, we're going to see Ireland used to be part of, like, British control. <laughs> They're going to be neutral. And just to give you a sense of like how much sort of residual anger there will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, who's the bad guy in World War II? Hitler, yeah. I mean, did he have sort of like a, <coughs> a goodbye, you know, bye-bye Hitler, and everyone goes applause, and then he goes off to like retirement someplace? No, no he, he shot himself <laughs> as his country was being decimated. So here's an example of like... <coughs> that they still had some ill feelings in, what was that, 1945 when Hitler died? There were still some ill feelings in Ireland. When Hitler died, the Irish government sent a letter of condolence to the German government. That's a sign that they're like, yeah, my, talk to my mom, because she grew up in Britain and she was in Britain during you know, World War II you know, lights out and everything, because the Germans, we'll see this in World War II, they're going to be regularly bombing and so forth. And at night bombing, you know, I don't know. I mean, if you were in a house, what would you do if you knew, figured that the Germans would be doing some night bombing? Turn the lights out. Yeah, and actually it's mandated, right? But here's what, here's what Ireland did in their neutrality. <laughs> they left the lights on. So sometimes the Germans could see Dublin in the distance and sort of use that as a help to guide. They didn't have GPS then because this is before satellites. But they could use, like, Ireland's, like, main a city as a guide in the distance to help them on their way to get to their targets. <laughs> so there's, put this down, there's going to be some, um, there's going to be some bad stuff going on leading up to Ireland becoming independent. Okay. And you can look at this and go, oh, get over yourselves. Oh, come on. Just because you were starving. I mean, come on. That was before the age of the government stepping in and throwing out checks, you know, to help people in their economic, uh, you know. But they were starving. <laughs> anyway, we'll get to that. Um, so, yeah, we got the Irish War of Independence, which will actually be followed. We'll get to this, not today, by an Irish Civil War. Because sometimes that's just what you need. After you win a battle, <laughs> you turn on each other. You win a war and you turn on each other because you're like, you didn't win the war the right way. You didn't. Here's the good news. You ready? Only about 2,000 people die. Yeah, I mean, you know. I mean, compared to how many people died in the Russian Civil War? The, yeah, I mean, the American Civil War. I don't, know if we, did we get, I don't know if we got quite to a million or so, but, I mean, we had a lot. Yeah, we had a lot of people dying in the American Civil War. But the, uh, um, the Irish War of Independence, you got about 2,000 or so. Um, put this down because we start with <coughs> some general notions of type, nature, and combatants in the war. Here's the key thing. Um, is it a civil war? After the, the war is accomplished, there will be a civil war. It's not a total war. It's not like you're going to have 
what do you call it? Haley, what do you call it when you don't have like big masses of uniformed soldiers lining up in a field pointing guns to each other? But you have people like that are not uniformed and they're like attacking and then they kind of like disappear into the regular population. What's that called? And it sounds like it sounds like a large African ape creature. Not a monkey, not a chimpanzee, not an orangutan. Starts with a G, rhymes with gorilla. Gorilla, yeah, guerrilla warfare. Yeah, so write this down. In the Irish War of Independence, there's a lot of guerrilla warfare. So, for example, on the one side, you're going to have, typically on the one side, uh, the Irish guerrilla. It's in the handout. Starts with a G-U and then keeps going. <coughs> so... On the one side, there's going to be a lot of guerrilla warfare, sort of, um, you know, attacking British and police and so forth. Let's go ahead and line them up, all right? So here are the two sides. On the one side, you have the Irish Republican Army, the IRA. <clears throat> no, the IRS comes after you for not paying your taxes. The IRA comes after you if you're a British and they're trying to take independence. Irish Republican Army. So they are like a uh, non-uniform guerrilla type operation, the IRA. You got that? Okay. Their political part will be a political party that will put people f up for election. And you can see it in the handout. It's called Sinn Féin. And you're like, it doesn't look like Sinn Féin. It looks like Sinn Féin or something like that. Yeah, but you need to pronounce it the way they do in Ireland. It's pronounced Sinn Féin, okay? And that's the political element of the IRA. It's kind of like you got one group, and you got the fighters on the one side, and then you got the politicians on the other. I mean, did we have that separation like in the Russian Civil War with the Reds? No, you're Bolsheviks. Was Leon Trotsky a political figure? Yes. Was he a military figure? Yes. When we get to Ireland, uh, we'll see that there's a bit of a separation there, but the British are like, I don't see any separation. Your political people are supporting your military thing, and you're a bunch of traitors. Go to jail. So, those are the one side. And you can put this down. They'll win. The IRA and Sinn Féin will win. They will get Irish independence. Do you understand that? Okay, so who's on the other side? Because when we get to tell the story and so forth, we're going to look and see who is on the other side. Well, you've got the regular British Army. You've got the regular British Army. And some of those guys are not that excited about fighting because they've just gotten through World War I on the Western Front, and they're not that excited about being sent over. In fact, many of them are like, I'm not signing up for this. So they had a hard time in Britain getting more people to sign. Are you all done? Yeah. Okay. They're having a hard time because you can come back and take your notes where you're where you're doing things. Uh, so they had a hard time finding people to uh, get signed up for the fight. Um, and in fact, they had a hard time <coughs> getting some soldiers and uniforms for those soldiers. So among some of the regular British Army types that are coming over, uh, you'll get some folks that are going to be dressed up in mis mismatched uniforms. These are typically like folks that are going to be signed up again for the British Army, they're like, well, where's my old uniform? I don't know. This is all we got. You got a little mixture of this and a little of that. You got some black that doesn't quite go with the tans. So the IRA types in the Irish population will refer to these guys as the black and tans. So the black and tans, make sure you write this down. They're part of the British Army, but these are going to be like World War I veterans sign up for the British Army. And they're like, oh, my gosh, are we going into this? And we're like, what? It's like, oh my gosh, at least I knew the Germans were on the other side of trenches. I can't go into an Irish Catholic village and know who is like for me and who is against me. I generally assume that they're against me. It's kind of like the British in uh, the American Revolution. If they showed up in like Philadelphia or so forth or some town, could they assume that the population that was standing around was with them or against them? It's kind of hard. That's the danger of a guerrilla. When we get to the, uh, uh, the war in Vietnam, 20th century war, You'll cover that in the 12th grade, <laughs> when the U.S. troops go into a Vietnamese village. You know, who's with you? Who's against you? That's, that's really difficult because you want the population to be with you, but you also don't want to be, like, shot in the back. 
You know, have you know somebody hand you a hand grenade and so forth, and then blows up in your face. Very difficult. Yeah, I mean, so like this is very guerrilla warfare is not fun to fight against. By the way, that's one of the reasons why the United States won. Yes, we had George Washington and regular troops and so forth, but a lot of our fighting was guerrilla style. You know, knocking off the British and so forth where we could. So. On the British side, you got the British Army, including the Black and Tans. You also had uh, people who were referred to as auxiliaries. Auxiliary. You see that in there? I'm trying to give you a sense of like what they would be. They're more kind of like part-timer soldiers, um, and they're going to be an important part of the British effort. But they're probably the best analogy I can give to you is. Okay. Right, the guys, the men and women who are providing security in Washington, D.C. right now, 20 some odd thousand and so forth, their regular job is not the military. You know that? I mean, I think there was even, like, I heard of like a former North Star graduate who has got a job, he's got a job, and he's also in the National Guard. So he's got training and background and the military and everything, and so they get called up for certain duties. Some of them are calling up to help out with the COVID, you know, situation and so forth, and some of them are called up to go to Washington, D.C. They should be, and I, that's why the analogy is not that good, because it's like, I don't want to diminish the, the, the professionalism of our National Guard units, other than to say, you know, when they're finished with their National Guard duty, what are they going to be doing? They'll come back to their, they'll come back to their hometown and go back to their work. By the way, the graduated from North Carolina, apparently, is like, ah, no, I'm really busy at work right now, so, you know, they got some other people. I think we ended up sending about 300 or so from Idaho. Did you guys see any of that in the news? Oh, is that right? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, they're hanging out there. I don't know how long. Hopefully not too, too long. Hopefully we can return a little bit more to normal stuff. So, auxiliaries. They're going to be part of the British effort. These are going to be some more, like, part-timer types. Not as well disciplined. You can write that down. They're not going to have the same discipline that they really should have. In that fact, that's going to be a part of a problem. <laughs> One of the biggest casualty events in the Irish War of Independence is a soccer match. I'm sorry, they call it football. It's a soccer match, right? You got all these Irish IRA, IRA supporters in the soccer match and so forth, and the, and the British are like, oh, I think there's bad guys in there. Let's just take them out. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's like, so you're going to have massive casualties at a soccer match. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know, it happens sometimes. I mean, like, does fighting occur in sporting matches? Does it? With the crowds? I don't know, the NBA is interesting sometimes, because sometimes you get some, some smack talker in the crowd, and the NBA player's like, fuse blown, and they jump into the crowd and go after them. It's crazy. Have you seen some of the videos of that? Anyway, I don't think that's happening as much nowadays, but, uh, you know, because they don't have as many crowds. And it doesn't happen in North Star. We don't have that. We don't have, we don't have that, right? Austin, you would never, like, just like break and just like charge the fans and like start wailing on them. Oh, okay. Other teammates. Oh, dear. Civil War. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not going to sign the Sokovia Accords. Forget it. Anyway, no. Different Civil War. All right. Uh, and then put this down. The RIC. The RIC, which stands for the Royal Irish Constabulary. They're going to be part of the effort on the British side, now they're an interesting component. Royal Irish Constabulary. What do you suppose a constable, what is a constable? What do they do? Do you know what a constable does? Tessa, do you know what a constable is? It's police. It is. Yeah, it's a police. This is the Irish police. It's constabulary with an E at the end. Constable. C-O-N-S-T-A-B-L-E. I think I got that right. Okay, constable. Okay. So a constable is a police officer. Now, here's the deal. This is going to be kind of problematic. Most of the people in the Irish police are representative of the Irish population. In other words, most of them are Irish Catholic. You can be like, what are we talking about religion and so forth? Does religion have something to do with this? There's going to be some religious affiliations that are going to be part of that dividing line. You're going to see some division among the Irish with the Catholics on the one side and the Protestants on the other. And it's like, well, is there a big difference between their religious belief systems that will cause that difference? 
Not that much. I mean, it's kind of like, oh my gosh, you're celebrating mass. <laughs> uh, no. But there's going to be some, probably the real most important differences are going to be like economic differences. As in, you can make a little note of this. Historically, the Irish Catholics are going to be among the most, the poorest, the lowest in society in Ireland over time. There's going to be a lot of resentment toward the English, the British, the Protestants who own the land and who have a lot of the power. Okay, so um, that's going to be something we'll keep an eye on. So here we go, the police. Initially, you can write this down, initially very supportive of their bosses, as in the national government. But eventually, uh, many of them are going to become more sympathetic to the cause of the Irish population, certainly the mass of it, which is the Irish Catholic population. Okay? That's the base. You got that? All right. Now we need to give you a little bit of background in geography before we get too far into the uh, history of things. We're going to get into the causes, but let's look at the geography a little bit here. In fact, we're going to go back a bit. Take a look at the map here. You need to know your geography. This large island is called Ireland. Yes. Yes, it's called Ireland. Is that the thing that's going to become independent? Yes, partly. In fact, this map actually tells you this main part will become Ireland, or the Republic of Ireland, if you want to take your pick. That's what's going to be gained independence. But the northern part, sometimes referred to as the Ulster counties, they generally don't want to be part of the rest of Ireland. You get that? You may need to write that down right away. So Northern Ireland, if you go to Northern Ireland today, are you on the island of Ireland? Yeah, of course you are. I mean, it's right there. It's a geographical thing. But are you in the country of Ireland? No. If you're in Northern Ireland, if you're in Belfast, their largest city, you are in the UK. The United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern, not France. <laughs> you're going way too far back. <laughs> you're going back to... UK stands, is short for, for, yeah, I mean, it's like, I mean, I just have United Kingdom. If I wanted to get into a really small font, I would write down the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Mm. There we go. Lights. Okay. It's wonderful. So, actually, I bet you can figure this out. Danton, what do you suppose the main religious affiliation is for the larger part of Ireland, which will be the Republic of Ireland? Starts with a C. Rhymes with Athlic. Thank you very much. Follow-up question. <laughs> Danton, what do you suppose the main religious affiliation of the people living in Northern Ireland that are still part of the UK? Well, they're all Christian, but they're not Catholic. Not, not opposite, but another main variant. Starts with a P. Rhymes with Protestant. <laughs> you got that? Write that down. So in Northern Ireland, <laughs> Northern Ireland is predominantly Protestant. The main part of Ireland, or Southern, I mean, you can't really call it Southern Ireland because, I mean, it starts out, the, the northernmost tip right up there is part of the Republic of Ireland. Okay, now, back up a little bit. I need to give you a little bit more geography because some of you guys, are, actually, I'm curious. See if you, how well you do on geography. Ireland is part of the British Isles. Okay, so there's two big islands that are part of the British Isles. One of them is called Ireland. The other one is called Britain. Britain. Or, as in the UK, they call it Great Britain because it's bigger than the other part of the British Isles, which is Ireland. All right, so if you look over this map, you can see, there it is. Oh, it's just off the coast. In fact, you can sort of see it, like, not too far away from that. Britain, let's see if you can identify. There's three major geographical components to Britain. Yeah. Raise your hand if you can give me... That's it, quiet. Raise your hand if you can give me the name of one or two or three of the parts of Britain. Very good. England, write it down. England is the biggest one. 
that has the largest population. It's the largest cultural component of the island of Britain. It's mostly the southern part. It goes all the way up about two-thirds of the way. What's the second one? Scotland. Write it down. Scotland is the northern third. It's Scotland. They're Scottish. Okay, on the main island of Britain. What's the other part? It's in the, uh, it's in the western part. What do you think? Wales. Don't put an H in that. W-A-L-E-S. Very good. And what is the, what do you call the people who live in Wales? They are called the? Very good. All right, nice job. Okay, all right. Let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, the, 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 <coughs> the Scots, the Welsh, the English, and the Irish. You ready? The original people, I don't know who the original people were, but the earliest people who are living in the British Isles are Celtic. Or if you're a fan of Boston basketball, they're the Celtics, okay? I mean, that's how they're pronounced, okay? But most people, if you like the music and so forth, with the lovely, like, that's Celtic, okay? So they are, in fact, if you think of, like, Stonehenge and so forth, they were built by Celts. That's actually in England. So the original inhabitants of what we now call England were Celtic peoples. You got that? Write this down. The Irish, the Scots, and the Welsh are all Celtic peoples. They're like originals. The English are newer arrivals. They're Germanic. Okay? So, so we have the Celtics, the, the Romans, you know the Romans, like they established a big empire and so forth, and they got part of the British Isles. They didn't get Ireland, they didn't get Scotland, they got, you know, the other part. But then the Romans are overthrown, and who comes in <coughs> and settles in what will become England? A number of, write it down, Germanic tribes, foremost among them are Angles and Saxons, okay? Which is sometimes if you throw them together, you're like Anglo-Saxon. Germanic. Our language, English, has its deepest roots in Germanic, okay? So actually, if somebody were to come up and go, are you a wasp? Are you a wasp? I mean, like, I don't fly around and sting people. Are you a wasp? W-A-S-P. Are you a wasp? But some of you guys are wasps, as opposed to not, not being a wasp. Because wasps actually do pretty well in English history and in American history. What's a wasp? Let's see if you qualify for any of the categories for wasp, as in being like in a really strong position. W, white. Got that? A-S, Anglo-Saxon, English. P, Protestant, there we go. White Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Have they done pretty well in like American history and so forth? Yeah. I mean, it's like wasp, 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 wasp. I mean, who's the first Catholic president of the United States of America? Kennedy. I mean, 35. I mean, and the rest of them have a lot of waspish, you know, a lot of Germanic and stuff and so forth in there. Got that? So, and also throw into the mix, Vikings started showing up and so forth as well. So you got Danish settlement, and it's like all these different peoples coming in. Valhalla. Valhalla. What? Where are you going to get to, like, Thunder Road or, or Mad Max? No, sorry, that's different. All right. Um, yes, witness me. No, wrong movie. Um, so we got Anglo-Saxons and so forth. Well, eventually, which is going to be the predominant kingdom that's going to be established in the British Isles? England. Write it down. England is going to be the most predominant. England is going to be the one that grows. England. It grows and grows and grows. Queen Elizabeth of England. The person who takes over after her, James. Some of you guys remember this from ninth grade. James, who was also the king of Scotland. So England and Scotland will come together. They had already subjugated the, uh, the, the Welsh. Put this down. The English are also going to subjugate the Irish. Write it down. The English are going to subjugate the Irish. And here's the thing about Ireland. Over the years, many of them are going to look and go, yeah, we're part of this English empire, or British empire, whatever you want to call it. And you know what? We're treated just as bad, if not worse, as some of those Africans and Asians in fact, they'll say, we're treated worse than they treated the 13 colonies in North America, which is a good place to stop off because we'll get into the wild history 
of that next time. If you can print them out and bring them next time, that would be great. Yeah, that's a little easier for me, but yeah. All right. Oh, good, thank you. Yeah, I've, now that I've discovered, I've just got one extra copy.